We're going to have a conversation with the president of the Washington Commanders, Jason Wright. So thank you very much for coming today. It's my pleasure. So uh, before I, we go into the conversation, I'll just give a little bit about Jason's background. He is a native of California, was an all-state uh, high, high school football player, had scholarship offers to play football at Stanford, uh, Cal Berkeley, and Northwestern, chose Northwestern. Uh, he was an all Big Ten uh, player uh, two times, an academic All-American at Northwestern. After that, he went uh, to the NFL, undrafted, but worked his way up and uh, spent seven years in various NFL teams. After that, he went to University of Chicago to get his MBA. And after that, he went to McKinsey, where after just three and a half years, he became a partner, pretty much the, the quickest anybody ever became a partner at McKinsey. And then in 2020, he was... Uh, pitching a client on a potentially hiring McKinsey, and that client turned out to be the Washington Commanders, and they hired him as his president. <laughs> That's uh, correct. So, so uh, very effective presentation. <laughs> Indeed. So uh, let's talk about uh, the name change. Mm -hmm. So uh, who gets the credit for the name? Is that your idea, or who, came, who gets the credit? No, I, I would argue that it was developed with our fans and a small group of folks within the organization. You know, we, we had a strategy at the very beginning that was different than other teams who were changing names in similar contexts. We weren't gonna go off in a room and just come out with something. We were gonna do extensive listening to our fans, extensive listening to alumni, community leaders, many people here got to be a part of those focus groups and interviews. And so I, I like to say it was a community effort that landed on this name after understanding okay. what the core values of Burgundy right. and Gold meant. What came in second? Ah, so you know. <laughs> it is just so unhelpful to think about what the alternative okay. could have been. Okay. Instead, Commanders is the name because it has you know, the weight and depth of a name that befits a 90-year-old okay. franchise. You but, know? Uh, but in terms of other possibilities, I know you won't tell me what came in second, but what about the Hogs? What about that one? I, I think Hogs had a lot going for it, a lot going for it. But I would like to think that whether it's hogs or red wolves or uh, a, a Washington-based name like DCFC or something like that. The aspects of those that really resonated with our fans were core values like grit and resilience, tradition, honor. And I think all of those things get captured by the name commander. So all the folks who like those should see a little bit of their fingerprints and their desires on where we landed. All right, so you did a pretty good job of keeping it secret. Um... And the White House should learn from you um, because they don't keep their secrets as well as you do. But, but uh, what did you think when Joe Theismann said it was the commander's? You know what's hilarious is Joe didn't actually know the name. He didn't. No, he didn't know. Joe had been calling me for about three weeks straight asking me what the name was. And he just liked commanders, was hoping it was commanders, oh. and just went on a little bit of a rant on uh, the radio. So that's your story. That's the truth. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So... Um, how do you keep it secret when, you're, when you have to get trademarks done and you have to have materials prepared? How did you keep it all secret? We made a trade, we made a trade off decision strategically. Um, you know, we could have taken the approach of not really engaging with people, not having a bunch of stuff ready for a big rollout. And, and we decided that even though we knew the name at best would land in a mixed reaction with our core fans because of the context in which we were switching names, that we still wanted to make it a momentous occasion that's at the, at the level that this fan base deserves and this city and this area deserve. And so when you do that, you gotta work with vendors, you gotta work with other folks. And so we became okay with the idea of things leaking as opposed to doing something that just flew out out, out of nowhere in the middle okay. of the night on Twitter. So um, usually teams have uh, nicknames and they have mascots. Mm -hmm. um, the president of the United States has a granddaughter who says she has a dog named Commander, and mm -hmm. or is that gonna be your mascot? I mean, as, as, I'm as open to that as any. Okay, um, but you haven't picked a mascot yet. No, the reason we didn't, th this is a brand launch, not a finalized brand. Okay. And I think one of the things we learned in the process, we have a very diverse fan base, and that's part of the beauty of those who have rooted for the Burgundy and Gold for, for generations. And we need to give space for the fans to inform the growth and development of this brand. So we're gonna partner with fans to bring back the fight song with adjusted lyrics and bring and help us design a mascot, help us design a fourth alternative uniform. That's the way we're gonna okay. approach this. Now the initials WC, that isn't what you intended, Come on, right? Man. No. <laughs> so you're not gonna use that. If, that. if that is the toughest criticism on the new name, I will be okay. okay. All right, so um, 
today, um, you would say the fan base has been pretty positive, would you would say? I, I'd say it's not about necessarily um, the initial reaction, because I would say with the core fan base, it's mixed at best. I'd say the national response has been overwhelmingly okay. positive, but within our core fans, it's been more mixed. And, and the context is that, you know, 80% of those fans didn't want the name to change in the first place. And irrespective of what I think or what other people think, that's their starting point. Okay. And so I am happy that the rollout was professional, that it was of the magnitude that we sought out to do, and that people and that they understand clearly why we landed where we landed, even if they didn't like it the most. Okay, so um, now it's the Washington Commanders, and um, you're going to have paraphernalia and equipment and other things, and people presumably starting to buy them already, right? Yeah, actually, we had uh, we broke uh, the record for merchandise sold in one day on Fanatics yesterday. Wow. Okay. So. Okay, let's talk about the team itself. Now, your job is to be in charge of the business side. You're not in charge of the football playing right. side. Correct. So I can ask you questions, though, but you're, you can say you're yep, not in charge yep. of that. Take this burgundy gold tie off and okay. just answer. All right. as a okay, fan. so uh, the team hasn't done so well in the last 23 years, you would great, say. Great segue. Um, <laughs> they've won two playoff games. They've been in six playoffs. So why should people think that a name change will make the team perform better? Well, I'd say, you know, a large percentage of those playoff games were in the last two years. We got to the playoffs in Ron's first year. Um, I think the team is a team on the upswing. Um, if you look at, this is my player hat, my football player hat. Um, if you look at a team that you feel like underperformed, the first thing you should always look at is the injury report. And by the middle of this season, we had 18 of our projected 22 starters that were out for a variety of reasons, whether it was COVID, injury, et cetera. When you field that full team, it stacks up against any roster in the NFL. And arguably, there's only one piece that needs to be fulfilled until it is a championship caliber team. And so I feel quite confident in what coach has built. Um, and there's a great momentum that our, that our fans see. You know, we are, our, our season ticket member base since I arrived has grown by 80%. We think that by the start of next season, it will have grown 150% above that base. Um, and so I think folks who are close to the scene, team and see the momentum and see the talent feel that coming. But originally, or let's say 20 some years ago, there were like 80,000 people showing up at a game. Now you're down to like 50,000, the second mm -hmm. lowest in the league. So you think you can get it back to 80,000? I mean, the growth would suggest it, right? Um, we're 80% up from when I started. I've only been here a year and a half. Um, and I think it's a combination of establishing just ways of working with our fans that are different for them. It's high levels of engagement. You know, I'll, I'll tell a little bit of a story. When I first got here, I met the folks in our ticket office um, and it was a small crew of folks. They were in a little part of FedEx. It was a little like little low lights, like kind of furniture that looked like it was from the 1970s, even though I know FedEx was built in 1997, right? Like it was like a little, it was a little, it was a little down, but there's beautiful places in FedEx field. And so we brought them up to the fifth floor and converted load space. It's everything you have in a great experience at FedEx Field, floor to ceiling windows, sunlight coming through. And now the workforce is about four times the size it was. If you walk in, it's like the beautiful hum of a high performing sales center. And I was there for inside sales promotions. And uh, Taylor Lauer, who's the dynamic female executive who leads that ticketing group now is announcing the, the promotions and the workforce looks like United Nations, these young folks right out of college. And she's talking not only about their sales performance, but also their character, what they did for their, their teammates. And I was so moved, it was a tough week for me. I, I was so moved that I was moved to tears because I was seeing the transformation that I envisioned sort of unfold before me. And I knew that in the background, and Dave, our chief ticketing officer is here, I knew in the background from him that 2021 we had two and a half times the new ticket sales that we had had okay. in 2019. So this transformation was also promoting something very good for our fan base. It used to be said that uh, there was a backlog of people who wanted to buy season tickets, 200,000 or something, but there's no backlog now. If somebody wants to buy a season ticket, they can buy it. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And what does it cost to buy a season ticket? Well, let me start with this. We got plenty of them. So if you would like. One. Okay. Well, I don't know what the cost is. Uh, I, I, uh, I, let's suppose I want the least. I think we should get you in a suite, first okay. of all. That's where we should start. Well, I'll think about it. But uh, <laughs> the least, if I, I just say, look, I want a least expensive. What is, if I want to go to all the game home games, what does it cost? I want to sit in the worst seat you have. Not that you have any bad seats, yes. of course, but any bad seat, uh, not, not, not close to the- No, if you, if you, if you wanted, uh, we'll call it the, the ecumenical community okay. experience yeah. in, the, in the upper levels. It's about $400 for the season. For the season? That's it. 
Or what does it cost if you want a suite? If you want a suite now, a it's a little more. But for you, for okay. you, a drop in the bucket for and one you, of our executive suites at you, you know like, three hundred thousand a year. Do you negotiate those, or they're all fixed? We we are always open to this. Oh, okay, okay, fine, good. Okay, so um, right, let's talk about the stadium itself. Um, the stadium, as you point out, was uh, built in the last century, mm -hmm. right? So um, is it good? It's, shape now? It, so one of the great things that's happened is we've invested in the experience at FedEx Field and our net promoter score is up 30% over 2019. And now that we've had one full run under our belt, we're looking at it as an opportunity to pilot the best available technology okay. for guest experience. The guest experience has improved, the in, ingress egress, which is fancy sports language for how you get in and how you get out traffic wise. Um, is down uh, is down 30 minutes on average to get in and out. So we've we've addressed that, mm -hmm. and fans are having the best experience that they have had at FedEx right. Field in a long time. So, what is the most profitable food that you sell there? Oh, uh, what's pro most profitable? Yeah, I mean, what's the highest margin? What's the, the highest margin food? I think it's actually. I think it's. It probably is popcorn. popcorn it's probably I popcorn. What's the most the beer popular? is not the most uh, the beer is what's not the, the highest margin, popular? although you might argue that if you paid for one of the really pricey ones. What's the what's the most popular thing you can sell? Well, the food? most popular thing actually now are crab cakes from a local Maryland really? uh, restaurant that. So what we did this last year and it's part of what has benefited the experience at FedEx Field is we brought in 12 local food vendors that are spread all across the stadium. And the intent was to make sure that when you came to FedEx Field, it wasn't just an also ran experience that you could have in any stadium, that you were having a uniquely DMV experience. And we will continue to do that. Our, our goals for the experience there are authenticity, local authenticity and frictionless tech enabled experience. And those are things that we're gonna continue to build. Are there ever problems with people getting drunk at the games? That doesn't happen. <laughs> It does happen. It does happen. But we have, we have good security and staff. Okay. And actually, one of the things we're thinking about doing, and this is something that we'll talk to many of you about as we revamp our strategy for next year, is can we have an experience for the folks that want to get rowdy and wild and keep them from the folks who want to have a family experience? <laughs> different parking lots, different ways of entry and exit, a dry zone that is just for families and their kids so that someone's not pouring beer on your daughter when you're trying to watch a game. Those are things that we are thinking okay. about and innovating. So uh, this, there have been reports that there were some, uh, uh, say, um, the part of the stadium wasn't so safe. Now, you would say that's exaggerated, but the stadium is safe. Is that yes, right? Very much All so. Right, so like I said, it's the, it is the best experience folks have had okay. at FedEx Field in many years. Okay. And let's talk about the new stadium you're thinking about building. How long would it take if you've got everything to work your way before a new stadium can actually happen? There are so many hurdles to go before we have a, a definitive timeline. I, what, I'll, what I'll talk about, though, is what I'm most excited about. And I'll take off my president hat a little bit here because this is one of the big reasons I took this job. At McKinsey, I helped start, and actually Ron Parker's here. Um, if you guys know Ron Parker, he's a, a, a brilliant leader who's done so many things around equity and inclusion, as well as just being a brilliant businessman. Along with him at McKinsey, I helped start a think tank that was focused on racial equity in society and the ability of businesses to drive capital to communities and individuals where yeah. it didn't normally flow. And so that's my professional passion. It's why I chair the Greater Washington Partnerships uh, Inclusive Growth Committee um, with Sheila Johnson. And so that is my sort of business motivation is that we can be profitable and drive equity. What you're able to do with a project like this, if you think about it right, is to think about it first as a 30 year economic development initiative. And we see ourselves as stewards of the economic development and social impact objectives of the area. Okay. And it is about understanding what leaders, whether it's DC, Maryland, or Virginia, understanding what leaders in those areas have planned for their constituents from an economic and social perspective and crafting a vision that gets in line with that. And that's been our goal from the very beginning. And so before you're talking about timelines and designs right. of stadiums and prices and ticketing and all of that stuff, we are thinking about how we get in line as an act of service okay. to leaders in the community, which is a core foundation of our right. brand as commanders. Now, a few years ago, a picture of a prospective stadium was put into the press, leaked or put in the press officially. That design is not being used. To the no. no, that's gone. All right, that one's gone. Okay. No, so no, there's no wave pool on the outside. Okay, there's no spikes outside. 
What I did like about it though, is the idea of trying to think outside of the box of what a normal venue could be. And that's the way that we're thinking about this. But to be realistic about it, the best case is five or six years away. Best case probably. Is that I, right? I would not, I would not even hazard to think okay. of the timeline. More so all right, what about, let me see, I can get you to say where it's going to be. Um, Washington. You think, okay, if I can't say the time, right. You think we're going to, no. Uh, Washington, Maryland, or Virginia. So all the folks They're across all, open. all those jurisdictions okay. are amazing leaders and partners to us. And like I said, our biggest thing is that we can listen to everybody okay. about what their goals are and try to figure out where we fit. And that's, that's our only goal. right? What now. about a dome stadium or an enclosed one? If we think about that. So I think there's a lot of considerations when you think about a business that expands beyond core football, right? You ne don't necessarily want a venue that is just there for eight or 10 events a year, or you'd add a few big concerts, maybe 15 a year. So there are considerations on making sure it's climate controlled in a way where you can have a hundred okay. events a year and have a retail hospitality complex around it that really drives commerce and drives jobs in a community year round. But is it a stadium that you want a local community to build and own, or would you want to build it and own it? I think those, everything that happens with a venue like this, if you're going to do it right, needs to be done in conjunction with okay. the community leaders. So any discussion of who owns what or who designs what, it needs to be done after we know where we're going okay. and in partnership with those leaders, not in silo or in abstract. Okay, let's talk about the NFL generally. Uh, you were in it for seven years. Um, uh, you were not drafted. So how did you get to actually be in the NFL? Cause I wasn't drafted either, but, uh, I didn't get in the NFL. How did you get in the NFL? There's a little bit, there's a little bit of track record there that even though I wasn't drafted, I had a pretty productive college right. career. Um, and I was undrafted in the NFL and, um, what, what that do you means do when you're, you go to the combine? Yeah, so basically it, actually in, in one sense, it's a little bit better than being drafted late in the draft where you don't have a choice where you go. I had a choice where I ended up. And so my agent and I had a sort of a bit of a, a pick between different clubs of where I landed. Now I didn't pick right because I only had about uh, five minutes and a cup of coffee with the 49ers before I got fired. Uh, and actually I'll talk about how I got fired. Well, how, how long do you, you get like two days of uh, workouts and they say no? No, I mean, I was there for a couple months uh, oh. in training camp. And then I came in from a two a day practice. We had one in the morning and then we have one in the afternoon. They don't do those anymore. They're not tough anymore. Um, I, I'm kidding. I came in in between practices and my name was off my locker. All my stuff was in a black trash bag. I had a yellow sticky note that said, please leave your playbook on the table here. And there's a cab to pick you up in 30 minutes. Is that how they tell you? Wow. That was it. Now we don't do that. We try to pick people. You don't try to tell we them treat made people a with dignity, right? respect. <laughs> but you don't say you made a mistake or is it somebody else or somebody? <laughs> I mean, sometimes they do. I mean, sometimes it can be very straightforward, but I actually am really grateful for my first year and a half where I joked that I was getting fired every other day because it helped me develop some of the things that really helped me in my career at McKinsey and helped me now. It, when you're in the face of failure, when something doesn't fall your way, are you as a high performing person able to find your confidence again? Are you able to recapture your swagger? Are you able to believe that you belong again? And I had this habit in my first year and a half where when I was down and out, I would go watch my highlight film. And I would just watch myself play great in college, play great in a preseason game. And at some point my body would just relax. And I would know then that I knew I belonged there that my mind was back in a good place. Cause if you're not confident, it's wow. a self-fulfilling prophecy, both that's, in business and- Okay, well, that's good. So, but at one low point, I saw an interview you gave with McKinsey Magazine where you said that you had to go live with your 80 year old aunt at one yeah, point. I ran out of money. You ran out of money. So, so what yeah, was I mean, that it was, like? It was great for me, honestly. I, it, it felt terrible at the time. It felt like crap at the time, but it was incredible for me. I was with the Falcons at the time. And at first I was living in uh, a hotel and then as soon as I was off their dime, I realized how much it costs. <laughs> and I moved into an extended stay motel and then they still hadn't brought me back. And so I ran out of money and my aunt lived about three hours from the private facility on the east side of Atlanta. I moved in with her. My rent was to take care of my special needs cousin on the weekends. And I would drive three hours every day to the practice facility. And it made me feel a bit distant from my teammates because I had this long commute. I didn't have the money to kick it with them and party with them the way that other folks build bonds at age 22 when you're in a unique right. locker room. And what I found was that there was strength in having a circle outside of the team. And I found it in my family. I found it in friends I met in community. The used car dealer that I bought a car from became a close friend. You know, people that I met at the restaurants. And that has been a hallmark of how I've approached 
my life right. and my career since. Because not only do those people support you, love you, care about you, not just for what you are doing professionally, which can happen in your bubble, but they also provide right. perspectives that are different than the echo chamber in which you operate. And it makes you a better thinker. When you're a used car salesman is becoming your friend, you really are at the bottom there. I got skills. Okay. I got skills at okay. making connections okay. with people. So ultimately you did get connected and you played. And these play, why were you not, I mean, you were all big 10. Uh, was you just, you were slower I was or slow. smaller? I was slow. I ran a four, six, five at the combine. And actually, if I go back, I'd make a different business decision. I decided to finish school um, and get my degree at Northwestern. My parents were come from the lineage of civil rights activists and were big on education. Right. And so I decided to finish school instead of go off and train properly for the combine. I, I would have left early, trained for the combine, probably ran a 4-4 instead and got drafted where I was expected third or fourth round. Yeah. But I didn't. It cost me a lot of money. But, you know, I would argue oh. it ended up all's well that ends well. Well, that was the same problem I had. I could only do 4-6 as well. So I, that's why I didn't play 4-6, well. that's a 20-yard desk, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I could get 20 yards. <laughs> I could walk 20 yards. Um, so let's talk about the NFL and the concussion phenomenon. Um, sure. You played in the NFL for seven years. Have you had a, your brain examined to see if you have concussions? I have. I have and what I does have. it say? Uh, I, I think I'm okay. Okay. So um, the concussion settlement is behind the NFL to some extent, but new players are potentially getting concussions. What, what are you doing to reduce concussions? I think the NFL has done a marvelous job with this, um, honestly. And I know there's several former players. I'm looking at one of my teammates, Tim Hightower, who leads our alumni group now. And the level of safety and protocols in place, the quality of the equipment, the different rules that are in place around game play. In fact, the way I used to hit and light people up as a special team, they say, I couldn't do anymore. I'd get flagged almost every time leading with my head. So they have changed the way that the game is played without sacrificing quality and speed. It's still a great game to engage. I think um, 48 of the top 50 shows on television last year were NFL games. Um, so it's still a very popular game. Um, but they've made it substantially safer for players while compensation has gone up. And so the risk reward trade-off is there for guys. It's still a great jump start to any career for guys who are in the NFL and it's safer than it ever was. So I feel quite confident in the, the strength of now, the players are big. I mean, they used to there are a lot of them are over 300 pounds. A lot of them. I mean, is there, what about a weight limit? So people wouldn't get hit by, are you trying to get in the NFL? Is this well, the goal? I, like you're talking about we're 40 well, time. I, you I mean, want a weight pounds. limit on it. But I mean, uh, you have drug testing, so they're not using human growth hormones to get there. They're just right. weight lifting weights. The, 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 the guys are just um, the level of that athleticism and the technology allows them to build their bodies and run fast and be strong. I mean, Montez Sweat on our team, one of our defensive ends, he's 6'7", he's 290 pounds, and he runs a 4'4", 40-yard dash. I mean, he ran down a wide receiver earlier this year, and I was just like the most remarkable thing that I've ever seen. So these guys are just just becoming, there's a generation of athletes that are, un, that are unlike anything we've ever seen. And it doesn't require any false anything except hard work and some good genetics from mom and dad. Okay. So let's talk about uh, some problems the NFL has had recently. Um, one of them is a, a lawsuit was filed just, to, I guess, yesterday, the day before, uh, basically saying that uh, the coach wanted to be interviewed to be a coach, I think of the New York Giants was um, discriminated against. And the the so-called uh, Rooney rule was really a sham. Uh, what can you say about that? There are only, there's 70% of the players in the NFL are African-American mm -hmm. and you have one African-American coach. Yeah. And the same is true on, on the presidents of the NFL. I think you're the only African-American president, right? Yeah. So you have one coach, one president and 70% of players. Uh, would you say the Rooney rule is working that well? Well, um, I think objectively, if you look at the numbers, the system is not is not working well, right? And um, with a specific um, nod to the situation in Miami, like I, I tend to not try to meddle in other people's business. I got enough stuff to handle on my own. I will say, though, I think there are enough proof points that if ownership is fully committed to diversity and inclusion, change can happen very rapidly. You know, the owners of this team hired a Latino head coach, a black general manager, me as the first and only black team president and the youngest at the time. And I in turn have built the most diverse leadership team in the NFL already. And that's in a year and a half time. So it, you know, it's a little bit of where there's, where there's a will, there's a way. And so it can happen. And the good thing is there aren't that many jobs. So it's a law of small numbers. So this is a low point. It can very quickly get to a high point if a few folks are committed. Now there are 32 NFL teams, uh, but none are owned by African-Americans. So. What is the league doing about that? 
I think I think Commissioner Goodell actually it's a big priority for him. Um, I'm happy if he wants to give me a, a <laughs> stake in one of them, but it's 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 a difficult process. You actually get into a deeper conversation, which is probably not for this platform, but um, there are systemic inequities in society that don't have a lot of black folks with the capital to buy one of those teams. Now there are a handful of folks, but that that is the challenge of creating a truly equitable and inclusive economy where we get to a point where you see black billionaires at the level right. um, where they are able to make these bids on NFL teams to be a sole owner instead of part of a consortium or minority owner or whatever it is. That should be a goal for all of us, not just not because we're checking some box, not because we're trying to have optics, but because if we believe that talent is equally distributed by God amongst all people, but we don't see equitable outcomes in society, then something's off. So. Um... Is it possible to own an NFL team and lose money? It's, or it's, it's impossible. Difficult. It's difficult. Right. Because the TV contracts are so good. It's difficult, um, but not impossible. It's difficult, but not impossible. And I think it's really important that we and every team focus on what we call the local business. That's season tickets. And I told you how we've had real growth over the last year, 80% since I joined. We think it'll be 150% over that baseline by the time the season starts. Um, it's important to uh, season tickets, suites, building our sponsorship pilot. We have great partners and sponsors and we've invested in capabilities to create more creative ways to partner with right. them, including a content studio that's a first of its kind in the NFL. It's important to build that not only because we want the franchise to be lucrative and we want good returns and all that and everybody wants to build a good business, but because the better we do as a business, the more I can invest behind what coach right. is doing. And ultimately the goal of all of this, the commanders at its core is to be a championship franchise. And so for every person in here who owns a suite, has season tickets, is a sponsor of ours, your investment in us is building the next right. championship. The next, the next trophy that comes under the burgundy and gold banner will be due to your participation with us. And so that's why we need to build this into a healthy business right. so we can get there. Now, over the last 23 years, you've had 10 coaches, the highest number of any team in that period of time. Um, is the current coach gonna be around? Ron is a good man. Ron is a good man. He doesn't report to you, but he you does not. Work and with we him. have a great collaboration. You know, in fact, to the point of focusing on investing in him, I already spent more millions of dollars than I care to acknowledge in changing the fields at the practice facility at the park in Ashburn and changing the, the, the turf at FedEx okay. Field to be better for the players, faster to play on, allow them to practice on it more often because the, the, the field in Ashburn was on a floodplain. Now the water gets drained right. off of it so they can still practice out there after a rain. Uh, so coach and I have a collaboration that works really well, I think in part because we're both former players. And Martin Mayhew, the general manager, also a former player on the 91 team that won the 1992 Super Bowl, the greatest team of all time, in my opinion. And because of that common background, we're able to communicate very seamlessly right. and the partnership has been fantastic. I said the 58 Baltimore Colts were the best team ever, but okay. I don't, I don't believe yeah, that's the case. That. Okay, all right. Okay, so by the way, who's the greatest football player you ever saw? So I, I, I would prefer to say it's the, the, the 91 Redskins team and the, the team that won the 1992 Super Bowl. Um, that's, that's, that's the official answer and okay. I think it's hard to debate that. All and, right. And actually, if you, it's hard to go into a single player because football is so inherently a team sport. It's but really let's suppose you had to pick one. If I had to pick one, I'll take off my hat and go back to my fandom as a kid and the experience I had as a player. And it had to be Jim Brown. You know, I played for the Browns for most of my career. And much like uh, Doug Williams is an advisor to me, Jim Brown was an advisor okay. to the Browns at the time. And I got to sit with him at lunch many times at the Cleveland Browns practice facility and just listen to his experiences as a player, as a civil rights activist, as a thinker through the ups and downs and mistakes he'd made in his life. And um, seeing him as a holistic, flawed and beautiful person make him my favorite. Plus in his, in his day, he was the size of the O-lineman, ran faster than everybody on the field. It's pretty damn impressive. Okay. So today, uh, you would say, if you were a young person, you have a son, would you like him to grow up to be an NFL football player oh, or not? He's fantastic. And he's a hell of an athlete, too. So I, I, how old is he? He's, he's eight. Eight. Okay. He's eight. He's eight. Ways to go. He is really good. He is really good. He's got. I was good yeah. at eight, too. But then. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Who said that? I, my mother said it. <laughs> she said I was pretty good. That's what but, I thought. Okay. <laughs> By the way, uh, speaking of people with my athletic skills, how many Jewish players are there in the NFL? 
There is an equity question for you. Yeah, right. Is there any? There is none, right? You don't have enough. <laughs> You're correct. So no comment. Working, no no defense. No defense. Okay. So uh, today, um, when you told you, you're a partner at McKinsey, you come home and tell your wife, I'm going to be the president of then the Washington Redskins. What did she say? Well, I think in general, people in my circle told me to run the other way. And why did you not? Because this represented an opportunity to have lasting impact, which as, as I sort of told you, like I, I am looking for roles and opportunities that leave a lasting impact on society, on our economy, on individual people. And so the opportunity to lead and a, a successful turnaround of an organization of this stature that had so much meaning to folks, lead the rebrand of an organization that um, with a beloved logo and name, but by as many as loved it, as many thought that it had problematic connotations. And to be able to oversee the deployment of the capital that will drive the economic development initiative that is a new venue and in, in, um, integrated retail, hospitality, neighborhoods surrounding it, especially for a 30, at the time, a 38 year old brother from LA who was focused on equity and inclusive growth, it, it, it kind of didn't matter um, what it looked like. And I was willing to take on any challenge to do that. And I just surrounded myself with great people that I could trust who shared my values. And we've made amazing progress on all those dimensions. I'm incredibly proud of what we've okay. done to date. Now, yesterday, uh, a Congresswoman from New York announced that she's gonna begin an oversight a hearing, I guess, for investigation of the various sex harassment charges that were leveled against the team before. Um, what can you say about that? It's such a difficult thing to speak to, especially because everything predates me and the leadership team that is here today. And then business leaders in the room understand that even if it were in real time, it's difficult to talk about sensitive personnel topics. But I will say this, you know, the period of this rebrand and the time we've been here has coincided with a period of very fast, very deep and irreversible change in the organization. And we now, as I mentioned, have the most diverse leadership team in the NFL. And it's a hundred percent turnover of the top team in the organization. It's not something I'd recommend to anybody to do. It's very disruptive. But in order to accomplish the goals that we needed to accomplish, we got there. And so this team now that we have is looking towards the future. It's, it's talking about the things that, you know, my ticketing folks have accomplished in building the season ticket member base by 80%, seeing great creative partnerships happening in sponsorship. We are looking forward to those things, all in service of, of Ron leading us to a championship in the next few years. Next few years. So you think we'll be at the Super Bowl anytime? We should be. We should be. I do. I, I really do believe we are okay. close. I really do believe we are close. Okay. So you were very involved in faith-based organizations and obviously religion is very important to you. So obviously you need to pray a lot, I guess, in this job, right? So how I pray, is I, yep, I pray, I'll, I'll do whatever it needs to do to get another but, W. <laughs> but this is an important part of your life. Is that right? I mean, you've it is, it is. I think, I think I, I, I did you get I've, that from your parents or they came from other, it's sort of, it's sort of my own journey. You know, I've had, um, uh, a lot of ups and downs in my, in my own personal life. And in those moments you reflect and you realize you need a rooting and a grounding that sort of extends beyond you. And my friends and my family outside of my bubble are part of that. Um, my meditation practices, prayer, and spiritual regimen, regimens are part of that. My physical health is a part of that. And so all of those things form a life that feels very connected um, uh, to the spirit within me. And yeah, it is a critical part of my balance and the way that I achieve and, and the way that I have a vision for things that is a bit different. So how many years uh, are you committed to doing this? I'm here until we get to our goals, right? We are okay. here to build a championship. We are here to be at the top of the league as a top performing business. And ultimately, I kind of want to say, I'm looking at many of the people on my top team. I want to see all of them go on to jobs as team presidents and chief revenue officers right. and COOs in the NFL. I want us to be a, a, a talent factory of the most diverse talent in the NFL. And maybe as a leading indicator and as a down payment proof point, the man who is our chief legal officer and leading some of our most important initiatives I knew he was probably going to be the first one to go. And it was my goal to land him as a team president in Major League Baseball. His name's Damon Jones. And he actually went and landed almost, almost. He's the number two at the Dodgers now. And what we have built internally in terms of talent is really, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of because as Damon left, we didn't have to go searching for talent. We had a woman named Molly Friedman 
was overqualified for her deputy general counsel job, but was there because she believed in us and believed in the right. vision that we had for this organization. She immediately fleeted up as a chief legal officer, added to it the title of SVP business affairs because she's got a broader mandate. And now we have one of the most senior women executives in the NFL in that role. Um, and so we want to be a talent factory for diverse talent right. in the industry. And it's starting to happen already. So let's suppose you win a championship and therefore you would say you can do something else. What would you like to do? Would you like to run for office, be the NFL commissioner, be an owner of an NFL team? Or all of those sound very fraught. Um, <laughs> I, I tend, I, I, have a, I have a bad habit of not thinking too far ahead. I tend to be nose to the grindstone. Okay. I think... There are several things that are exciting in sports media and entertainment. Um, and so I could go down a list of those, but right now, I, what I would say is anything that I would do outside of this, we need to have the same opportunity um, for impact and change. And that's on the big topics of society, the same way that this franchise is at the intersection of so many things that are important in our cross-cultural dialogue. I'd wanna take on another challenge like that, something that's nasty and gnarly and complex and will require amazing people like those I've recruited to these teams. So um, it's very complicated to understand what the salary caps are and all those things in NFL. I mean, it's like you need a PhD to figure out how to do it all that. It is actually very complex. But what does the average NFL player actually make in terms of compensation? Um, the veterans minimum now, oh my gosh, they make, they make good money. They make good money. The veterans minimum now I think is 1.1 million. So right. if you've been in, yeah, so if you've been in the year, uh, if you've been in the NFL for uh, six years or beyond, your base, your lowest is one. Hey, and what's the most you can get paid? It, there is a, there's not a, there's not, not a big a, limit. Yeah, not a cap. It's just, if you pay one person a lot, you, you're going to have me playing uh, <laughs> at then, all the other positions. What the, is there a rule that says um, the players get X percent of the revenues and the owners get X, Y percent? Yeah, of the, of the national revenues, the part that we don't control that come from the league writ large, a bunch of that goes directly into the pot for player salaries. And that's a great thing because, you know, their stardom, their effort, um, what they're able to do on the field does drive that. And so it makes a ton of sense. And, um, you know, I was a union rep when I played in the right. league. In fact, I was a union rep for the Cardinals during the 2011 NFL lockout. Um, and so I know the guys at the union, DeMorris Smith and, uh, and, and the team there, and they, uh, Georgia Tala and all those folks I consider, you know, friends, and I think they're brilliant thinkers, and they've done a good job of, of structuring a situation where player compensation continues to grow while the overall league continues to grow. And hopefully that sort of harmonious relationship remains in place for a long time. So you've been on teams that have won games and lost games. So what's it like in the locker room when you lose a game, the coach come in and blame the players or what does he do? <laughs> Not a good coach. Um, I think um, on, the, on healthy organizations, there's a sense of shared and collective responsibility. And I actually approach it the same way with my team uh, when we mess up. We, are, we, we fail together and we succeed together. And the, one of the great things about being a player at the highest level is you actually learn to let wins and losses roll off your back. Players don't dwell on them the way that fans do. Fans, will ruin your week. I get those, we get those calls. <laughs> we get those calls, how we've ruined their life for a week and how they wanna give away their season tickets and then they're back the next week. It's a highly emotional thing for fans. But as a high performing player, you learn to let it go because you know that a win and a loss was probably a difference between um, doing the right thing on one play and not doing it on another. And even if you really did just blow it and you feel like you're on a bad team, you have to convince yourself that you can compete the next week so you can't dwell on it. We would have phrases like flush it, forget it, put it away, because you have to move on in preparation for the next one. Guys in the league are of the, of the utmost professional quality and they have the ability to intensely focus like no other profession right. does. So when you were a player, you're, what's your height? Your height is? I'm 5'11". 5'11", okay. 5'10", 5'11". Yeah. Okay. Right. So um, when you have a 300-pound person coming at you and knocking you down, what does that feel Didn't like? Didn't always knock me down. Um, <laughs> but I mean, doesn't that hurt a lot? No, not for, I guess, I mean, yes, it does. The next day it hurts. You're very sore the next day. But, you know, as a player, um, you know, I, I played several, I was a running back at, um, as my main position, but I could flex down. I could flex my weight down and play slot receiver. I flexed up and I played fullback, which Tim, you did not enjoy me being the fullback when, when I had to start fullback for half the season because it wasn't ideal, but I flexed up to 220 pounds to play fullback. Um, and I could hit. That's what I, I made my career on hard effort and hitting, honestly, really? um, and the ability to be adaptable. And, and maybe you could argue it's the same way for me in business. So, all right, as you do the rollout of the Washington Commander name now, what is your, what are you gonna do in the next couple months? 
Yeah, so the next couple of months is really about allowing our fans to give more meaning and infusion to, the, to this name. You know, we have the word mark, the logo. Uh, we did some cool stuff yesterday with branded Teslas going out into the community with our alumni and popping up at schools or community centers. We lit up several buildings in the area with the name and logo. Um, tomorrow, we'll have a big event at FedEx Field um, called the Park and Party event, where we will show an extended version of our brand launch film, really tying the history of the franchise to this new name, um, and have a giveaway for our fans, have alumni and players there, um, as well as we will watch um, the, uh, uh, the, the film built on the 1992 Super Bowl team, the 91 season of the Redskins, and we'll watch that together as a as a community. And then over the coming weeks, you should see stuff at Union Station and the airports and popping up all around the city because we want you all to get familiar with us as the Washington Commanders. And so familiarity is big. So you're gonna see us everywhere. Maybe in a way you haven't in the city and the area before, but then we're gonna do things with fans to build emotional connection. You know, We're gonna do a um, making the uniform documentary with Nike to talk about the specifics of how things got put together in the new uniforms. And on the back of that, launch a campaign to design the fourth uniform in conjunction with our fans that would go into play in 2024. And we're gonna do many different things like that with our fans so they can build some sort of emotional right. connection to this. But why did you keep the same colors? I mean, if you're making a change, why not go all the way and get different colors? That was the first thing that folks told us. They said, you mess with these colors, oh. you have failed this enterprise. Oh, really? And it didn't matter what age folks were. It came through in, um, in the analytics we did on submissions online. It came through when you looked at the snail mail submissions, burgundy and gold was everywhere. Um, and, and burgundy and gold is the essential tie to the history and it will, it will never change. Okay, and today, uh, what is the biggest single challenge that you face as the president of the, uh, of the Washington Commanders? The biggest I think, challenge. I think the biggest thing is that we need to get out there and build trust with the community. Um, you know, I don't, I don't care to know all the details of the history of how we interacted with the community and our season ticket holders and all that. I know the team that I've built operates with a high level of integrity, high level of professionalism, with care, with empathy, with creativity. We have an incredibly creative group that is creating great products for folks, whether it's suites, uh, content with partnerships. And I think for us, we need the humility to approach each conversation knowing we have to build trust that it's not just plainly there, that it needs to be earned or re-earned in places where that trust has been, um, that, um, uh, that trust has faded in the past. Um, and so that is the biggest thing for us. And I think that just takes time. That takes humility when we mess up, owning our mistakes and continuing to come back and show people who we are. And I think I have the right folks to do All right, that. so you enjoy what you're doing. I do love it. I and love you it. expect to be doing it for a number of years, right? I do, I do, I'm tired, don't get me wrong. Okay. I'm tired. It's exhausting, but I absolutely love it. And so you never go out to the players and say, well, this is how I did it when I was a player. And no, they don't need to hear from me. They don't need they don't, one. They no don't advice. need one lick from me. In fact, I try when I go sprint on the field and work out, I try not to do it in their sight so they don't see, you know, how, how lousy I've become. I want to thank you for a very interesting conversation. I have a gift for you. Um, let me give it right now. Oh, thank you so okay. much. Wow. There you go. Beautiful.